happy to be here with all of you today um, to talk about the culmination of this very inspiring, groundbreaking project. Um, this is the first ever District Attorney Artist in Residence program. And I want to say up front that I'm very grateful to a fair and just prosecution, a great nationally known organization that works with prosecutors across the country. They came to us and asked us if we would be interested in doing an artist in residency program at the DA's office. And as a fan, I'm just really thrilled that we have a DA like Larry Krasner. Uh, we jumped for joy. <laughs> I think it took two seconds. Uh, we had thought a lot about artist in residency programs over the years, but we had thought about embedding ourselves in city departments. So this was a twist on that very powerful idea. Um, so we applied to Art for Justice, and thankfully, we received the grant. So the program, the program was designed to humanize people living and working within the systems of criminal justice by cultivating relationships and making connections. It was also a way of deconstructing and analyzing and understanding what a DA's office does. The result of this project is called Points of Connection, and it is a series of portraits conceived of and created by the wonderful James Yahya Huff. Um, what we're doing is trying to expand public awareness about the need for innovation and new thinking in criminal justice reform and highlighting the efforts being spearheaded by the nationally known and innovative Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Howe is a renowned painter. He developed and augmented his artistic talents while serving a life sentence at Greaterford Prison. He took classes, and he took classes with the mural arts program. And I want to say that it is one of the high points of my life, and I say this personally and professionally, that I had the opportunity connect, to connect with artists like James Huff. Working in Greaterford literally changed the trajectory of mural arts. It humanized us, it made us more empathic, and it set us on a course that is bearing fruit today. As I said, James had a long sentence, but after the US Supreme Court ruled that juveniles cannot be sentenced to life in prison in 2012. James was able to appeal his case, and lucky for all of us, he got out. Since he left Greaterford, he's been living in Pittsburgh, and he has been creating nonstop and becoming a well-known artist, and we are so proud. And today, his work is featured in a new show that opened at MoMA PS1. So we're really thrilled that um, we were able to join forces with him. Um, James was always, I would say, one of our star students in the class, and that he was wise um, and mature and insightful, uh, not just about art, but about the world. I always felt that the work at Greaterford was really, it transcended being an art class. It was like a think tank where people were creating their own work but doing major pieces about criminal justice reform and thinking deeply about the world. So we would bring in different speakers, mayors, city council people, policy makers, visitors from around the world, the president of the Ford Foundation to come and talk to the men at Greaterford. And over and over again, people would say, well, when we're sitting in this room, we don't feel like we're in a prison. And we're like, right. The stigma that hovers over people is just huge. And so we need to do everything we can to change it, to flip it, to remove it, to bring people together. And in, with James in creating this project, that's what he wanted to do by asking people that salient, powerful question, what is justice? And by asking everyone on all sides of the issue. Because when crime and violence happen, it's really easy to blame one entity, but the truth is that everyone's narrative, all of us who are involved, our narratives are shattered. And how do we start to repair it? 
Well, those are the tenets of restorative justice that we subscribe to at Mural Arts, and we feel that other people involved in reform efforts do as well. So James thought, I'm going to pose this question to everyone involved. Um, I just want to say, it has been a delight knowing him. It was interesting to watch his process. This was not easy. We had one plan, and then COVID happened, and it upended everything. But James stayed on track, he stayed on course, and because of that, we're able to dedicate this brilliant series of paintings today that speak volumes of what it means to have a city that is more equitable and humane. Um, I'd like to introduce James Yaya Huff. citizens who are also doing a lot of very powerful and positive work trying to end crime and violence uh, in the city of Philadelphia with respect to people who are coming back into the community by giving them jobs, uh, morale, training, etc. And also people who staff and work in the DA's office who do the very hard work of protecting the public, ensuring public safety, and also um, prosecuting crime and violence uh, in the most fair and equitable, equitable way. So, you know, I'm humbled to be here. I just want one thing. I really want when people see the portraits in the residency and when they discover more through the keep, Keepsake exhibition uh, that, we've, that we've put together to give people, um, I just want people to see themselves reflected in the eyes of the portrait subjects. I want them to form an empathetic bond amongst each other. Uh, whether we know it or not, we're all just as impacted. Um, and I'm just honored to be here today. I, I really. I want to give thanks to uh, Smokey Wilson for showing up, a uh, beautiful a friend of mine. Also want to give great props to the champ for showing up, but no options. <laughs> when we speak about Justice Impacted, those two represent some of the best uh, ideas about what reform can be. Um, through mentorship, through friendship, through brotherhood, um, we see positive, powerful things come out of that, you know, and that represents great change for the city of Philadelphia. So with that said, um, let's remain on the pathway to peace and let's open this residency up. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Those words are, are stirring and inspiring and will stay with us. Um, I also want to thank the very wonderful Paul Farber and Ryan Strand Greenberg for their contributions to this extraordinary project. Uh, it takes a village to do something like this. Trust me, 
um, and they were absolutely invaluable, critical, every, everything that I can say. And I also want to say that James has worked on um, probably a little over 50 major murals throughout the city of Philadelphia. So as you're traveling around the city and you see the collection of outdoor art, understand that part of the power of mural arts is that we have shifted the paradigm on who is making public art. The question is, who's getting represented and who is doing the representing is a key question that all of us should grapple with endlessly. And the fact that James and his colleagues helped contribute to the collection here is noteworthy and significant. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce RDA, and I, for one, will say how thankful I am to DA Krasner and to his incredible team here for their support of a very innovative, out-of-the-box idea, but also for everything they do every day to make our city safer and stronger. DA Krasner. So thank you all. Uh, delightful to have you here. I'm going to be quick because we need to hear from the champ, Bernard Hopkins. There's another champ here too, Smokey Wilson. These, both of these men were champs boxing in jail. And I want to make sure, because they are so passionate about what they are hoping to do moving forward in terms of preventing violence, preventing young men from going down the path they went down early in their lives. I want to make sure they tell the simple story. The simple story of how old they were when they met, where they met, what that meeting has meant in their lives, and what that meeting and that relationship, which, which spans some approximately 40 years, means about how we address the bigger issues that we are facing at this very minute, in this very city, when it comes to violence. I want you to know that James Huff, the champ, the other champ, these are people who have never walked away from the fact that they did something wrong when they were younger. But these are also people who I believe have proved a fundamental point that we should not lose, which is that there are no monsters and there are no saints. There are no monsters and there are no saints, that the criminal justice system right now is built on the cracked foundation of the notion that you're either all good or you're all bad. Well, here's the news, and you already know it. People change. Almost everybody is capable of positive change if they are given the opportunity. So let me just speak very briefly. First of all, the DA's office is extremely grateful to Mural Arts uh, you know, Mural Arts is a Philly institution. It is an international institution. We have something like 4,000 murals all over the city of Philadelphia. It is a lighthouse. It is a beacon. It is a place where tourists come from all over the world just to see our murals. And the way those murals are put up says something. The way they are put up is there's a deep dive into the community where they're going to go. And the topic of the mural is in many ways formed by the people who live there, which is why they don't tag them which is why they don't deface them, which is why they don't mess with them, unless it happens to be Frank Rizzo, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> um, it, it, mural arts is a tremendous asset to this city. As far as I'm concerned, these are in a divisive time. These are things that unite us all, have been united, uniting us in Philly for decades. This is public art at its most magnificent. These, to me, are vertical parks. It's a place where people gather and are proud of who they are and what they are. So thank you. Jane Golden and Mural Arts. Um, I want also to thank Miriam Krinsky, who is one of the most important figures among the progressive prosecutor movement in the United States and her organi organization, Fair and Just Prosecution, which allows us all to learn from each other and to learn from models that are either American or from all over the world, to learn from science. There's been far too little of that in criminal justice. Most of it has been politics. And it has been politics for the sake of promoting the careers of prosecutors instead of good policy. So we thank her for that. We're obviously very grateful for the funding for this, which did not come from the taxpayer. It came from the Art for Justice Fund. That is a whole story unto itself. And if you don't know it, you might want to check on it. It's a fascinating story about where the money for the Art for Justice Fund comes from. 
But let me just say uh, briefly, I want you to bear one thing in mind when you hear from Smokey Wilson, who is right there, and he's also right there. And when you hear from the champ, the other champ, Bernard Hopkins, who is a Philadelphia icon for many reasons and an international icon within the world of sport and boxing, I want you to think about this. James Huff, all those murals we're talking about, he did them when he thought he would never be outside the walls of a jail. He did them on huge pieces of cloth inside the walls of a prison, and he worked and worked and worked on them for essentially nothing back except the joy that you get from that art. Why did he do that? When you talk about Smokey Wilson, why did he mentor Bernard Hopkins? When you talk about Bernard Hopkins, why has he done what he has done ever since he came out on a sentence of five to ten years? Why has he gone to every school he could to speak on these topics? Why has he led the life he's led since that time? I want you to think about that. As I come back to my last point, which is what I said before, monsters and saints, not exactly. You can do something pretty terrible and do some pretty wonderful things in the world. So I'm going to ask these two very well-spoken, very interesting men to try to confine their remarks about four or five minutes. And uh, why don't we start? Who wants to start? Okay. Okay, here we go. One of the champs. Come on up, Mr. Wilson. Hello, hello, hello. I want to first say that um, I'm privileged to be standing here today after serving 46 years, six months, and one day in the British Fourth State Penitentiary. I was a juvenile that was convicted of a murder uh, that took place with two other juveniles in the city of Philadelphia. I was sentenced to spend the rest of my life in prison at 18 years old. I didn't believe that. I just didn't believe that I should spend the rest of my life in prison. While there, being a former gang member, I made up my mind that I'm gonna um, go to school. I'm gonna get involved in some of the programs. I'm gonna do some good things. It didn't just turn out like that automatically, but you know, as I began to grow and the help of other people were encouraging me that was older. You know, I turned out, I found my way a little bit. But anyway, one of the dreams I had while I was there is getting out of prison. How was I gonna get out of prison? I got involved in the boxing program. I became um, a three-time middleweight champion in three different weight classes in the prison system. You couldn't tell me I was in the middleweight champion of the world. Marvelous Marvin Hagler was one of my best fighters, Sugar Ray Robinson, and we can go down the list today. The program under the United under the um, AAU Middle Atlantic Amateur Boxing Federation came to an end as far as funding. The program was going down. I was in I was in the SCI Dallas Correctional Institution. I was going out in the yard one day. And one of my friends said to me, they said, you should show somebody what you know. I heard what they said. Years later, maybe four, five, six years later, 84, 83, an old head from the neighborhood that I grew up with knew a young guy who was come who came to prison with certified as an adult to serve adult time. And that he knew him and that he wanted me to meet him. I met Bernard Hopkins on the back of D Block. D Block is not a block that anybody just walked on and grades for. So when I came on Greek D Block, I seen a young guy on the block. He's like curious what he's doing standing there. So I went on about my business, and um, the old here from my neighborhood came out, and he spoke to me, and he said, "Oh, here's Bernard Hopkins." And Bernard Hopkins, he reached out and grabbed my hand. So I knew just through the protocol of what the street life was like that he'd been around some old heads. Somebody showed him something gave him the understanding on how he should move about, you know, especially being in a place like that. We got to talk. And um, he asked me what happened to my eye. And I told him that I had a detached retina because a person stuck their finger in my eye and then Artie McLeod. He paused a moment and said, that's my mother's brother. The rest of his history. We had a decision that we were going to the gym and it was going to beat up everybody and it was going to win all the titles. Now, it turned out like that. But I didn't know it was going to be like that. But what I loved about Bernard, because he was a, uh, he reminded me of myself, because I met him when he was like 19. And he always worked it out. Physically, I was always known for being in good physical shape. And he's always in good physical shape. To make a long story short, Bernard went home. He made me very proud of him. 
go on and become the undisputed middleweight champion of the world. Because that was my dream. You know, the middleweight champion of the world. And I lived through this life. You know? And doing that, I'm saying that as a protocol and the people from the city of Philadelphia with old heads there for the respect and have the and have the um, respect for the young people and the truth and the experience, they listen to us. And that's what I want to do now coming home. I believe that I was going to get out. I'm grateful for being out. I believe that God was going to let me out. I continue to do the things that I was doing with inside the prison that brought me to this point right now. That I'm speaking to the district attorney on a few occasions. And now that I'm here now, it's a champ. And um, we want to do something to galvanize other men within the community, our communities, the inner city, to bring about some change. And that's what I'm here for. So thank you. Bernard Hopkins, Jr. First off, first I'd like to uh, thank everyone for thinking of me and thinking of uh, um, the champ, the legend, and teaching. Because that's what Smokey Wilson was, not a trainer to me, he was a teacher. And I'd also like to thank Jane Gold. We met 20 plus years ago, um, having our coffee on Fairmont Avenue. And I'm going to get to the Fairmont Avenue because early in my career, I used to stay at City View Forming Suites, 21 on Hamilton Street. And I used to walk up to Fairmont Avenue at the coffee shop that we met. And I was at that coffee shop. There, there every day. As a young fighter, O and one, my record started off. I lost my first four rounds at the resort casino in Atlantic City. But why I walked up to Fairmont Avenue is because it was still there. Halloween is coming up, so maybe social distance they'd be having Halloween at the Fairmont prison. Eastern State Penitentiary. Never been there. But I used to stare at that wall and have my coffee, sometimes by myself, sometimes I get lucky and can't go to come by. It was the reason, and I told Smokey and Yaya and everybody this morning why that was important to me. Not because I wanted to go back. Not because I missed the place at Greater Ford and I wound up at Dallas. As Smokey mentioned, he was also there, didn't know him then. It seems like his full circle and how we supposed to have connected at Greater Ford. But fair amount of it, and looking at that was inspiration to me. Never again. Easy said than done, right? And before I get started, I love to see Real, real 